Hey guys, welcome back. Skitstone series episode 20. Topic today is the frame buffer and how to go about rendering to that device. I'm always honest, when it's a boring topic, I let you know so you can skip the video. This video topic is very interesting and very cool. And I'll first start off with the examples, which are also very interesting and cool. And today we're gonna be in a virtual machine for the examples. Why is that? I'll tell you in a bit. Example number one I wanna show you is this screensaver I made that changes the flag whenever it hits the boundary. Obviously it prefers grease, don't know why that is. It should be random, um, which it is. Don't, don't wait around for your own country. There's only seven countries in there right now. Uh, if you want to add your own country, download the code, add your own, remove the ones you don't like. Ireland, for example, uh, that's very cool. We also got, um, this is a cool one. Basically, this is a three-dimensional rendering. So basically, it's a three-dimensional cube model that we parallel project onto a two-dimensional plane. We have vectors that define that plane. Um, Obviously we move that plane around space so we can orbit the cube like you're seeing here. That parallel projection is then rasterized onto this two-dimensional bitmap. You can see the orange lines on a black background, very cool. And then lastly, I wanna show you this. If you have epilepsy, do not watch the next 10 seconds of the video. It's really, really dangerous. Uh, yeah, pretty cool. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the theory. There's not much theory to explain in this video. Uh, it's gonna be pretty quick. So. Question number one, what is a frame buffer? What does that even mean? Well, um, Wikipedia has a good example, a good uh, explanation. Thanks, Nigel. Um, but basically, it's a bitmap file that your monitor is always displaying. Long story short, very simple explanation to that. Um, about the frame buffer, it's literally a file. So it's, it's a file on your machine. Where is it? On Linux. Oh, I should say, this is also possible on BSD, but it, you have to jump through some hoops to make it work. Um, but it's a, a file located at this directory, dev fb0. There might be an fb1, I don't know, could be. You can open and write to this file like any other file using syscalls. We've covered that in so many videos. And you can get details about this frame of work, which you have to, by the way, um, like the resolution, the, the color depth, the size of your screen, that kind of stuff using an IO control syscall. And then once you know all that details, you can treat frame buffer like any other bitmap that we discussed in episode 12. Only difference is that the Y direction is flipped. But once you know that, everything seems to work out all the same. So very simple stuff. Some uh, tips here about the frame buffer from Donnie Thornberry. So yeah, the thing is like X11, Wayland, these types of things, they don't share the frame buffer device. They have complete access to it and you're not able to write to it um, without you know them letting you. So the easiest way to do that is either, well, two things. One is to just not bother with like X11, don't even start that. Or alternately, you can use that, but then when you want to actually render something to the screen, switch to a different you know virtual TTY, um, that's not using X11 or whatever. So for example, on my computer, that's control alt function key. I know on virtual machines, it's just you know the host key plus an F key. You can Google it, figure it out for your computer and your install. Um, but yeah, so you have to know that before you start. Now to get the info about your actual frame buffer, again, it depends on your resolution for your monitor. And so the way that works is we're gonna first use our file open function that we covered in a previous video. Um, and we're gonna pass in the file name of this file. And that file name is, as I explained before, dev fb0. So you pass that null terminated file name into our file open function, open it with write permissions. So you can actually write to the frame buffer, very important. Um, and then yeah, you open the file. Now, once you have it open, you can get some details about this using the IO control syscall and this you know, frame buffer IO get vscreen info thing. That's just a, basically a, a number and we've defined that in our syscall listing here so you kind of can see the value of that. It's probably different on BSD, you can check. I haven't implemented this functionality for BSD because I think very few of my viewers even use it but if you want to, this is the process. Um, so yeah, you can call this IO control syscall and it will basically fill up 
this array of memory. So you have to have initialized 1280 bytes somewhere that you can drop in all your frame buffer info. And basically you only care about 12 bytes from that chunk. And those are basically three of these four byte ints. And um, the first one is offset zero from this array start. And that's how many pixels you have in the X direction. Then four bytes from that at an offset of four, you have the pixels in the y, y direction. And then um, you have four bytes at offset 24, which is the bits per pixel. So for your RGB, let's say it was 32, you would have eight bytes for R, eight bytes, sorry, eight bits for R, eight bits for G, eight bits for B, and eight bits for alpha. I guess that's transparency or something. Maybe it's not even used. Um, so yeah, with that information, you can kind of figure out how big is your frame buffer. That's very important because you need to be able to write to some memory location that is that size. So let's say your frame buffer info pops out and saying, hey, your monitor is really bad. It's 640 by 480. Let's say, for example, well, then you have 640 by 480 times bits per pixel. Let's say it's 32. That's four bytes. So you have to have four times 640 times 480 bytes in memory that you can constantly be manipulating to whatever pixels you want them to be. You want this pixel to be red, this pixel to be orange, whatever. Then you can take that buffer and you know that, that frame buffer buffer, that your own memory chunk that you're using to write to the frame buffer, and then you can write that with a write syscall to this file descriptor, RAX. That's the idea. So basically you're making your own buffer that you will then dump with a write call to this file name in a loop, assuming you want to have a loop. Maybe you don't. So here's the process that I use, which is just, you know, probably bad. I'm not very good at this stuff. First thing that I do is I make a heap. Again, we don't use like the C runtime. We don't use like Linux, you know, heap management stuff. We have our own thing. So I make my own virtual heap where it has to be at least big enough for that frame buffer. So if it's, let's say my computer is 640 by 480 by four bytes per pixel, I have to have a, a heap that's at least that big, plus however much extra I want for my math, for my computations, whatever else I'm doing. Then I'm gonna get their frame buffer info and then allocate memory on that heap to be big enough for my frame buffer. So I'm making a frame buffer buffer as you can see here, and that's all done in this assembly file. You can check it out if you're curious. And then you just start drawing stuff. You change pixel values at this location in that file. We covered this in episode 12. And then if you wanna have a rendering loop, like for example, we had in that screensaver and we had in that orange cube spinning thing, we have a rendering loop. If you don't want to have a loop, you just render once and you're done. So it's pretty easy. I highly recommend giving it a try. All the code is available, so check it out. With that out of the way, not much theory to cover, to be honest. I have six examples. We already talked about three of them, but I'll talk about how they work in more detail right now. This might be a bit scuffed because I have to kind of go back and forth between my computer and the virtual machine, but we'll make it work. So example A, this is the Well, let me run it first, show you what's going on. So if I run this code, it pops out. My monitor happens to be 1920 by 1080 with a 32 bit color depth per pixel. And that would mean that my frame buffer would be in bytes, 8,000 some odd bytes in size. So this kind of represents what I was talking about in that slide when I said you had to do this and it would give you these pieces of information and you can use those to determine how big your buffer needs to be that you're gonna dump to the frame buffer. Um, that's what we've done here. So let's show you how that works. It's pretty much just what I said. Let's take a look at the code. And so what are we including? We're including pretty much nothing, just the ability to open files, which we have to do, exiting our program, and then something to print. So what do we do? First, we open that frame buffer device, that dev FB0 device with the read and write permissions. You need write permissions, obviously, to draw things. Then we run that IO control syscall, getting the details about the frame buffer device. 
dumping those in memory. And then you can see here, I'm basically just printing out those values. So at offset zero, that's the X resolution. Offset four was the Y, y resolution. Offset 24 was the bits per pixel. You have to know these are four byte values. So you have to move them into a four byte register. Or you can do tricks to, to make that work, but it's easier to just do move into ESI as opposed to RSI. Yeah, and then here at the bottom, you can see I've just basically multiplied all those three things together. I've divided them by eight to convert bits to bytes. That's what this means, shift right ESI by three that divides it by eight. And then I print out the number of total bytes for the frame buffer. And then we just have to know that when we initialize our heap, it's gotta be at least this size. And of course, if you were using the C runtime, you wouldn't have to worry about this because you always have an infinite amount of memory that you could access we don't we have to make our own heap and so yeah it gets a little bit harder but as long as we make sure our heap is at least 8200 and whatever eight, sorry eight eight million bytes yeah then we should be fine so next example i want to show you is example b this is let's run it and see what happens okay obviously i have to be in the virtual machine to see anything let's do that Oops. We got the flag of Mexico. Oh, I missed the, the emblem. What a, oh, what a, oh well, no big deal. Um, so yeah, what is this doing? This is basically doing what I just said, and it's just drawing a couple rectangles to the screen. So let's see how the code works. Uh, here. So how does this work? Well. First thing we have is we have to have a heap that is big enough. I said it had to be at least 8 million bytes. So here our heap size is initialized at 16 meg. That sounds about right to me. Um, so we have a heap that's big enough. So what do we do first? First, it looks like we open the frame buffer and we're saving that file descriptor somewhere. Great. Then we are grabbing all that frame buffer info as before in this location, but you can see we've done it on the heap. I didn't actually make a slot of memory in the binary, it's it's in the heap, I, you know, realistically speaking. So that's that saves memory in the binary. Um, we call that IO control sys call, we get the number of bytes. At this point, we now have, uh, we're calling this heap alloc to get a, a new buffer, I believe, yep, that we can then uh, write to. Here you can see we're looping through rows and columns and we're changing the colors to green and white and red respectively. Uh, yeah, so that's how that works. And then at the very end, you can see once we've got that buffer completed, you know, it's got green and white and red or wherever it has to have it. Then we have one last syscall here that is a syswrite call that just dumps our entire contents from our heap allocated memory chunk that is our frame buffer buffer. And we dump that to the actual frame buffer file descriptor, which we saved in R15. So that's how we're able to draw that. So it's a very simple, very simple process. And I'm just curious, how big is that, that file? So that entire program, the entire ability for us to generate a heap and draw things and then dump all this to the frame buffer, get all the stuff, the entire program is 545 bytes to draw, to draw the flag of, of Ireland with the with incorrect color, you know? So very, very small file size. What's next? Uh, example C, this was a frame buffer clear. So this is uh, basically, let me show you. At this point, we're kind of combining our functions, our, our, uh, our listing, our, our code into functions. So if I go to example C, open up the code, you can see now our code is gonna be much smaller and cleaner than before. So here you can see I'm initializing the heap. I have a new function here called frame buffer init. As I explained before, that function handles all the nitty gritty stuff. It it checks, it makes a you know heap allocated space for the frame buffer info. It grabs info from a you know the IO control syscall. Then it um, makes a, another thing on the heap that's exactly enough bytes for the frame buffer buffer. Um, so that's what that does. 
then I have this clear function that basically it just makes every pixel on the entire screen a single color. So you can see we move that color value, RGB value, into RDI. We call that function, and you can see here the entire screen was green. That's what it did. And this last function is that syswrite thing I just showed you, but again, contained in one function. So this flushes our frame buffer buffer to the frame buffer, and then you can see the program ends. So everything is now contained in its own little function, and this is, I guess, in my opinion, the best way that you should go about drawing things. You should make functions for each part of the drawing process to make it simpler and easier to execute, and it's more modular, and you can change things very easily. And it's also more applicable. So this frame buffer clear can be used Let's say, for example, in our screensaver, we're using frame buffer clear black to constantly set the background to black for before we draw the flags. And then in the, the cube spinning, every loop of our rendering loop, we're clearing the screen to black. So yeah, very cool stuff. If you didn't clear the screen to black, you would basically have that ghosted flag and you'd have that ghosted cube. You'd have a circle at the end of the day, you know, or an orange circle after a few seconds. So yeah, that's not what you want. Um, what next? Example D, this is the epilepsy warning thing. I'm not gonna show it again unless you really want me to. Fine, I'll do it again. Fine, fine, fine. I just gotta do it. You know, it took me five minutes to make, I gotta do it. Yeah, this is awesome. I love this. Um, and what is this? You can guess, right? This is just basically us changing the the color using that clear function, red and blue, red and blue, red and blue, red and blue with some delay. Let's see, let's make sure. Are we doing that? Here's our loop. We have a delay, we make the screen cyan, flush it to the screen, another delay, make the screen red, jump to loop. So yeah, that's what I said. But what's next? It's the flag one. Okay, this one's pretty cool. So this one, the way it works is, yeah, you can see here, I've got these countries defined. If you want to add your own, go ahead. I added Greece because it has a lot of, you know, rectangle stuff, so it's it was, you know, a lot more involved. Just to show you that you can draw anything with rectangles very easily. And we have some simple ones here as well. Um, and what happens is basically, I'm pretty sure, it, we, let me show you the top. So we have these functions that we're using, um, init, clear, and flush from before. Then we have these two functions that we've made in a previous video. We have this set filled rectangle that we made in episode 12, I believe. And then we have this random int function that we made in a previous episode as well. And so what happens is basically, you can see I've defined the flags of Greece, of Italy, Poland, all the rest, France, in terms of the RGB values in each rectangle and then the locations of each rectangle. Um, yeah, so that's all defined here, Belgium, Romania, Ireland. Feel free to add your own and remove the ones you don't like. Um, then you can see when the function actually starts, the program actually starts here. Again, we initialize the frame buffer, all this stuff. We randomize our X and Y locations for our screensaver to start off with, randomize the start country, and then we have a, a loop that constantly checks yet, have we yet hit the border. When we have, we check, pick a new random number, pick a new country, Etc. you can expect you know, how this would work. And I'll show it again just because it took me some time to make. I don't want to minimize the amount of effort it took, probably like a few hours. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, if I were to change this, I would make it so it couldn't pick the same country that it currently was. I'd add that check. So you'd always have it change whenever it hit the border, you would never have it stay the same. Or you could just add more countries. For example, we have Italy three times in a row. That's not very, you know, pleasant to look at, in my opinion. Or sorry, Mexico might be, might be. Um, what next? Um, the last example was that cube rendering in in 3D. That was a lot harder. That probably took me like the better part of a week to implement. Um, and again, it's not my full time job. I do like half an hour a day. Um, but yeah, let's check this out. It's pretty, pretty cool. So how does this work? Well, a lot of things. So again, we have these inputs for the frame buffer init, clear and flush. 
I have this function that I added here. Again, we have sine and cosine. That's to calculate our current orbit around the cube as we're spinning. Um, and then I have these other functions that I made. So one is perpendicularize. <laughs> is that a word? I don't even know. Um, basically, I'm, I'm when you're when you're rendering something, I'll cover this in a later video, you have to have your your vector as the viewer. So you have to have your y in your x direction, and then you have to know where you're looking, and you have to have that normal, right? So you have to be able to pick what's going on. And so this function basically subtracts off a component of one vector from another. And so you can guarantee that two vectors are perpendicular in this way. So. Basically, if we're looking from here to there, I, I can figure out what my normal vector is to that with this function. And then lastly, the, the real heavy hitter here is this rasterize edges function. This function does everything. This basically takes your three-dimensional edge set of, of vertices and edges, and it projects them onto a two-dimensional plane and then rasterizes them in a way that you can then print. And so you have to pass in a bunch of stuff, the size of your total array, and some pointers to things. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, actually, I'll talk about it right now at the, at the bottom here. So you can see we have two func two structures here. One is a perspective structure, and one is an, um, an edge structure, which then contains pointers to the actual vertex, vertex locations in 3D space. and kind of a, a pairing of which vertices are part of which edges. And so you can see here we have eight points and 12 edges. Point addresses at points, edge addresses at edges. And you can see here our points are basically a, a, a two by two by two cube. Um, and then you can see here the edges of the cube I've drawn out here. And so you can see that one edge is between point zero and one. Another edge is between points two and three, etc., and this would trace out all of the different edges of the cube. And so basically, you have to pass in this perspective structure and the edge structure into that rasterize edge function. And what is this perspective structure? Basically, this contains where you are looking from, where you're looking at, and also where your up direction is. And ideally, well, it doesn't matter what you put in, um, this has this will generate you know based on what you put in, but this these three points should be normal to the looking vector that you've established with these six points, or at least two points, I should say. So this vector has to be perpendicular to this, this vector here. And then we have a zoom value to basically zoom in and out. But when you have a, so there's two types of projections. I'll talk about this later, but uh, in, in real life, we see a perspective. So things that are further away are smaller, but in, in engineering, typically you want to use a parallel projection that would kind of like keep things the same size. So just about how far something is away, it won't be smaller. It will just be projected parallel. Um, it's very common for engineers to always change settings in their software to ensure that things are parallel. For example, at work, we use CAD software and everyone I know changes the projection from perspective to parallel, the first thing they, that they do on the job. So yeah, very important stuff. So yeah, basically, actually, you can see here, our cube is a two by two by two cube with the point at one one one, and our look vector you can see here is at you know basically one one one. And so, how is that possible? How can we see something on the screen that's on our face? Well, it only works with a parallel projection. That wouldn't work with the perspective. With the perspective, everything would be super zoomed in, and you couldn't see anything in this fashion. So it has other uses as well. So yeah, how does this work? Basically, um, in our loop, you can see here, we make the screen black. Then we are, you know, we're rotating around the cube, ideally. So I'm calling cosine and sine to kind of pick out, hey, where are we now? And so if you saw down below, we had a memory address dedicated for rotation angle, rotation increment, as well as tolerance for those sine and cosine. And again, sine and cosine are Taylor series expansions. We implemented those in a previous video. And so every frame, we're recomputing our position using two different Taylor series expansions to a tolerance of 0 0.00001. And so you say, well, that might be slow. Really, it's not, though. The limiting factor on the rendering is not the math. 
<laughs> and the CPU usage to put all the pixels in the right spots, the real, render, the real rendering limit is the syscall that we have to use to constantly dump our entire contents to the frame buffer. Remember, we have an eight megabyte array, basically, of pixel values that we're dumping every frame. And there, there are better ways to do that. We might cover that in a future video, but as of right now, that's what we're doing. And so that's the limiting factor on the performance. And so, yeah, that's what these things do here. Sine and cosine, that changes our, our looking direction. We'll cover this more in a future video. And then um, perpendicularize that again, like I said before, make sure our up direction is normal to our looking direction, which is again, required. And then this function is, is the heavy hitter. This basically does everything. So we pass in our frame buffer address. We're passing in the color we want to rasterize as for all our edges. Here you can see I passed in orange as a color. And then we pass in the width and the height of the frame buffer, as well as those two structures I mentioned before with the edges and the points and the perspective all defined. And then we call the function and that basically does all the work and fills the frame buffer buffer with the rasterized edges. And then we flush to the screen. And then you can see here every iteration of the loop, we are incrementing our perspective angle around the, the orange cube. And so I will again show this example. Yeah, you kind of can see how this how this is working. And we'll cover a lot more about 3D rendering in a future video. I have a lot of plans. In fact, this is how we're going to actually render our three-dimensional models. And I should say, let's say you want to do FAA or whatever, you can render it like this. You can render the mesh, right? And you can deform the model, and then you can see how the mesh changed. A lot of cool stuff we could do. Um, and uh, the, the really cool thing <laughs> that, that I think we can do with this is because it's a bitmap, we can also write this to a file. So we can take this capture write it to a file. Also, we can put that in an embedded HTML report. You know, we can do our own 3D rendering for many different purposes, even as images. So we could draw like, you know, a car, a hot air balloon, a bus, anything. You could model anything and you could draw it in this fashion. So pretty cool stuff. I hope you like this video. There's so many possibilities when you can write to the screen like this. I didn't know this was possible. Well, I did, but I didn't know it was so easy up until like three or four weeks ago, and it's been crazy ever since. If you guys want to hang out, we have a Discord server, link in the description, check it out. If not, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.